the people of the neighboring villages insist that nearby there's a cave full of pigments that are what configures all there is where they live. And if anyone was to go in there and manage to set eyes on these pigments, he would see the whole place for miles around and he himself turn into paint. Look at the name. Look at the name in the mouth of one passing through. Look at the place in the mouth of one who lives there. It's almost herb-like, the word. And the air keeps on gliding and gliding, like a gigantic frame. If you tried to speak to him with his own words, you would see the air enter your eyes, and like a tree, your vision tremble. Systems. Poetry is a system of revolving mirrors that slide with harmony. Shifting lights and shadows in the fitting room. Why? The frosted glass, as if talking, engaged in conversation. With the linen on the table and the soft music, I would tell you, my dear, that this or that reflection is the poem, or one of Fitz's aspects. There is a possible poem about the Duchess who met her end at Yekka Te Rinberg, and when the red sun moves about on the window panes, I remember her blue eyes, I don't know, I've spent so many hours, that is, on trains, at night, reading detective stories, all along, alone in the empty house we used to open the wardrobes. And one night, on the way to Bern, two men kissed one another in my compartment because it was empty, or I was sleeping, or it was dark. One hand seeks another, one body seeks another, and now the mirror revolves and conceals this aspect, the real and the fictitious. What is convention, that is to say, and the things we have lived, the experience of the light in winter forests, the difficulty of establishing coherence? It is a play of mirrors, acts that dissolve into unreality. Acids that invade old photographs, the yellow, the leprosy, the rust and the moss that efface the images, the tar smeared on the face of the boys, and the canatria. All that died one afternoon with the bicycles, the red chrome sunk in the cistern, slow motion, the bodies in space, as well as time under the water, darkened like the bottom of a cracked mirror. The fitting room is the access of this poem. All brow. What would become of us without the animals if at a certain point every animal that lives were to abandon the earth? Mankind would fall into a deep depression. I remember the day he said it like something he remembered as if quoting from a great writer. Nothing got him quite so worked up or made him so furious as when animals were spoken of as inferior beings. He hated it when a person got compared to an animal because of something they did or that happened, especially if, like boxing champion, all brow, they could knock you out in a one -er. Talking about him, he often said that literature and boxing use exactly the same language style. Allbrow is the living proof that what matters in art is lying. Because being a boxer, black and gay, means the very worst thing you can do is say you're sorry. So what was going on in his head must have resembled what Allbrow felt when John Cocteau 
fell passionately in love with him and couldn't stop trying to get off with him until at last he convinced Coco Chanel to arrange a meeting at the Castile Hotel where he got absolutely nowhere because all was a dandy. He sent his shirts to London to be ironed. Collecting purebred horses was his hobby, but when he made love, it had to be with an animal, a young guy from the slum, the kind of guy you'd die for. If he had been left without any animals, all brown too would have fallen into a deep depression, practically indistinguishable from culture. Defeat. The rudder gives direction to the ship. The mountain is the ruin of a country turned upside down. The buildings are underneath and their foundations stick up. In the ruins lies a buried people. If you listen carefully, you can hear inside the mountain a deep and muffled voice asking, always asking. Motto, I'm grateful to fate for three gifts. To have been born a woman, from the working class, and an oppressed nation. And the turbid azure of being three times a rebel. Two teeth. Two teeth have left a trace of pomegranate on my breast. When you still have none to sink into what is melting away. Like the murderer returning to the scene of the crime. Like the murderer returning to the scene of the crime, having lost the memory and forgotten its loss, who finds at the door the one he'd thought dead and not knowing why, enslaved to him, becomes the dog that guards his house from death, the absent thief that can steal the ransom. That is how I returned to the love scene of a cactus, like a monstrous reptile with spotted skin, with slimy entrails, it lay in its corner drinking in the sunlight. All at once, its malice awakened Reviving, it cracked the flower pot. Beyond the orchard, to be lost track of, it was hurled over an arid wall. And after time, upon the rugged stones, poking among the crevices and seams, I found the old dragon, still raging and clinging. Now I'd like to write. Now I'd like to write a nice poem and talk about certain things you still can find that are nice, in my opinion. Or, according to the neighbor next door, I want to be nice today. I want to say nice things. I go through the whole house on my knees, looking for nice things praying that today I'd be given certain things that were really nice. I've gotten out of the habit of nice things. Everyone knows what the things of this world are. I've lost the habit. I don't know where I left them. Maybe at the cafe. Maybe on a beach. By some promenade. It's possible. It's possible. How can I know? But now it's night, and frankly, it's no time to go out searching for nice things. Gentle things, nice things, precisely. The cafe is closed now. The promenade is dark. You can find certain women who want certain things. I'm tired. I'm not in the mood to do anything. It's better to go to bed. Tomorrow will be another day, and by then, 
I'll be over this desire, this flaming mania for nice things that suddenly come over me, that suddenly come over me, I mean, that's come to me. Hawking, now I am a falcon and I clutch my master's fist. I breathe in the fresh morning air and the smell of velvet and sable, the sweat of horses, the trampled hay, the steam rising from the ground, grass and tiny flowers, a luxuriant tapestry I shall see from aloft when in circles magnificent I view my dominions, the grassland, the dwarf trees, the brook, the elusive hare, and the horses, the spaniels, and my lordship with his knights and the great falconer, the pages, the attendants, all equally dwarfish, scattered throughout the meadow. My lord says to me, I want a large hare, smelling of lentiscus, my lord's a poet, as he strokes my feathers with his fingers. I feel an emperor perched on my lordship's fist in my leather hood, fringed with streamers. There is movement, the sound of strident voices, neighing and prancing while the kennel grooms unleash and urge on the dogs. The moment is near. My lord caresses me. He wants a large hair, smelling of lentiscus. I'm a poet as well. My heart is pounding. And now at this point, I am the Lord and master of the world and the people. Everyone within my circle paying me undivided attention, expectant while I am lost to sight in return as my flight spirals, assesses, spies the frightened hare. My eyes are like arrows. My talons grow sharp and a sweet giddiness overwhelms me. Sky and earth are one, the trees and the clouds, the grass and fur of the skittish hare. I see nothing. A power pulls me down toward the pit of nothingness, and I strike like lightning. By whose will am I ruled? What dark power pulls me down? What strings move my wings? What fire is so able to heat my body's blood? Now in my talons, I hold a dead hair, smelling of earth and lentiscus. It's all over. My empire has fallen. The great falconer will allow me to tear a piece of warm liver. My lord will laugh with his friends afterwards in my hood fridged, fringed with streamers. I shall feel ridiculous. That which makes us forget ourselves always lasts so little. First love. In the, in, in the dreary Girona of my seven-year-old self, where post-war shop windows wore the grayish hue of scarcity, the knife shop was a glitter of light in those small steel mirrors, pressing my forehead against the glass, I gazed at a long, slender clasp knife, beautiful as a marble statue. Since no one at home approved of weapons, I bought it secretly. And as I walked along, I felt the heavy weight of it inside my pocket. From time to time, I would open it gradually, and the blade would spring out slim and straight with the calm vent chill that a weapon has hushed presence of risk i hid it those first 60 years behind books of poetry and later inside a drawer in amongst your knickers and amongst your stockings now almost 54 i look at it again lying open in my palm just as dangerous as when I was a child, sensual, cold, near my neck. Insolent youth. 
Now that you see them leaving the classrooms, their eyes sparkling with cries of euphoria, the boys in mild sweat, girls with blatant lemon-shaped breasts, you stop to behold them, wonderingly bewildered. As you think of what it is about this wild and brazen show of youth that still calls your attention, you already know. You'll continue down the road you've taken while they pass by in a flash without seeing you. A gust of fleshy lips and tan bodies, forever unredeemable, smiling and triumphant, leaving you only your desire and unavailing envy. Is it the lust of the mind that fondles their lustful bodies? Or knowing they have yet to grasp the bittersweet revelation of experience? Or is it understanding precisely that there is nothing to prevent them from falling slowly, the same as you, into the age-old trap of resigning themselves to good and evil while they think, though misled, they're getting to know themselves. America. America is the neighboring village, any small village in Catalonia. Youngsters throw stones at gypsies, people scowl at strangers, the blacks are, are blacks. The poor become rich there, the young make their fortune, and the, and the, flesh air beside the, the fresh air beside the last few huts there begins a heaven which is open to everyone. There you can be alone and with others. You can roast green peppers. And the aubergine crickets sing, races mingle, weeping is permitted there. I can help you on with your socks. We will gather, we will gather, we will gather and the villages come together in their love. Evenings in the bar, strange individuals come from nowhere who don't know where they are. Lay down the law for the world now being invented. Americans from Santander, from Barcelona, and the Catalans, Sioux, and Mexicans will own a new kind of petroleum. There has as yet no name, nor will have ever. However, often, shepherdless, you refuse to serve me with sacred gas. America is the neighboring village. In Granolias, Ametya, Borges Blancas, Mataro, Morelia, Cadiques, and in Monturi, eating chocolate. In the present manifesto, we have eliminated all courtesy from our attitude. Any discussion with representatives of today's Catalan culture is pointless, as they are negative artistically, though efficient in their orders. Compromise or politeness lead to the regrettable, deliquescent confusion of all values, to quite unbreathable spiritual atmospheres and to the most pernicious of influences. Example, la nova revista. Violent hostility, on the other hand, clearly establishes values and standpoints and creates a hygienic state of spirit. We have eliminated all arguments. We have eliminated all literature. We have eliminated all lyricism. We have eliminated all philosophy. An enormous bibliography, as well as all the efforts of today's artists, take the place in favor of our ideas of all of this. We merely make the most objective enumeration of facts. We merely point out the grotesque and sorry spectacle of today's Catalans intellectuals enclosed as they are in a stifling, putrid atmosphere. We warn those who are not yet infected against contagion, a matter of strict spiritual asepsis. We know that we are not going to say anything new. 
We realize, though, that this is the basis for everything new there is today and everything new that may be possibly created. We live in a new age of an unforeseen poetic intensity. Machinism has revolutionized the world. Machinism, the antithesis of circumstantially indispensable futurism, has verified the most profound change humanity has ever seen. A multitude, anonymous and anti-artistic, is collaborating with its daily effort in the affirmation of the new age by living in consonance with its age. A post-machinist state of spirit has been formed. Artists today have created a new art in keeping with this state of spirit, in keeping with their age. Here, though, people continue to graze idyllically. Culture in Catalonia today is of does no service to the happiness of our age. Nothing could be falser or more adulterating. We ask Catalan intellectuals, of what use is the Fundacio Bernat Metge to you if you then confuse ancient Greece with pseudo-classical dancers? We state that sportsmen come closer to the spirit of Greece than our intellectuals. We would add that a sportsman free of artistic notions and all erudition, is closer to and more suited to feeling today's art and today's poetry than short-sighted intellectuals with their burden of negative training. For us, Greece lives on in the numerical results of an airplane engine, in the anti-artistic, anonymously manufactured English cloth destined for golf, in the nude, and in the American music hall. We note that the theater has ceased to exist for some and for almost everyone. We note that the concerts, talks, and shows common amongst us today are usually bywords for stifling places that are as boring as can be. Opposing this new events on intense joy and joviality demand the intention of today's youth. There is the cinema. There is the stadium, boxing, rugby, tennis, and a thousand sports. There is today's popular music, jazz, and modern dancing. There are motor shows and aeronautic shows. There are games on the beach. There are open-air beauty contests. There are fashion parades. There is the nude beneath the electricity in the music hall. There is modern music. There is the motor racing track. There are exhibitions of art by modern artists. There are also great engineering and magnificent ocean liners. There is an architecture today. There are appliances, objects, furniture of the present age. There is modern literature. There are modern poets. There is modern theater. There is the gramophone, which is a small machine. There is the photographic apparatus, which is another small machine. There are newspapers with the quickest and the most enormous amounts of information. There are encyclopedias of extraordinary erudition. There is science and great activity. There are informed and guiding critics. There is et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is, finally, an ear, motionless, on a small, upright smoke. We denounce the sentimental influence on Guimera's racial commonplaces. We denounce the unhealthy sentimentality served up by the Orfeo Catalá with its worn-out repertory of popular songs adapted and adulterated by the people with the least feeling for music or even for original compositions. We are thinking of the optimism of the singing of the American revelers. We denounce the absolute lack of youth of our young people. We denounce the absolute lack of decision and daring. We denounce the fear of new facts, of words, of the risk of ridicule. We denounce the lethargy of the rotten atmosphere of the cliques and personality cults mixed up with art. We denounce the critics' absolute lack of information on the art of today and the art of yesterday. We denounce young people who try to repeat old painting. We denounce young people who try to imitate old literature. We denounce style architecture. We denounce decorative art that is not standardized. We denounce painters of crooked trees. We denounce the Catalan poetry of today, made up of the most time-worn cliches from Maragall. We denounce artistic poison for use by children, such as Jordi, for the happiness and comprehension of boys and girls, nothing is more suitable than Rousseau, Picasso, Chagall. 
We denounce the psychology of girls who sing Rousseau, Rousseau. We denounce the psychology of boys who sing Rousseau, Rousseau. Finally, we acclaim the great artists of today in the most diverse trends and categories. Picasso, Gris, Ozenfant, Kiriko, Juan Miro, Lipchitz, Brancusi, Arp, Le Corbusier, Reverdy, Tristan Zara, Paul Eloir, Louis Aragon, Robert Desnon, Jean Cocteau, Garcia Lorca, Stravinsky, Maritain, Reynal, Zervos, André Berton, etc., etc. The Yellow Manifesto, Salvador Dali, Sebastia Gasque, Luis Montaigne, Barcelona, March 1928. What would they think of the internet? We were three, we were two. It was me alone, we were none. We were three, our heads down in the darkness of vintages. With the sea in our eyes and wine dregs on our hands. When the canal starts smoking and the forest salt and a child's cry sparkles upon the mountain, we were two, standing on the rock of stars, our hearts bloody without darts or sling. When the wasteland starts burning and the tar begins to sob in the latent deeps of lighthouse furrows, it was me alone, a shade among old shadows, representing another shadow on the beach, where among spread nets, the sleep of all signs on in the feverish darkness. We were none, robed in leaves of darkness, when fear reigns on the petals of marshes, and the other, the pure, freed from rudder and sails, sets out watchfully towards the brilliant instant. Time was. Let me escape into your old domain. Our ghosts still drift about the usual place. I see the winter sky, the metal footbridge with its blackened struts, the scurf of grass along the burnt up track. I hear the express whistle, its gathering thunder rocks the ground we stand on till we have to shout. We watch it pass, you're soundless. Laughter sets me laughing too. I see your dove gray blouse, the blue of your short flared skirt, the red scarf bunched around your neck, the one I used to call your country's flag. All's as it was that day, the words we said come back and now the one bad moment. Something has silenced us. You've hurt your hand. Remember how it fluttered and hung limp? Nervously fingering your cycle bell, it's just as well we're interrupted. Now, as before, the tramp of metal heels, steel helmeted, surround us. A command darts out like the savage glitter of a snake, and we hide our faces in a lap of fear till they have passed. Now we've forgotten how we were. Their unreflecting movement restores us to ourselves, and we are glad to be together in this place, not caring if we speak. So we may kiss, we're young. Those distant silences have no authority. The fear of others kills our private fears. Freewheeling down the avenue, we feel the cold as each tree spreads its heavy, massive shade. We glide from chill to chill, unconsciously. Autumn room. The blind, was, the blind not fully closed, 
like a sudden fear held back from falling does not separate us from the open air. Look, there are 37 neatly ruled horizons, yet the heart dismisses them. Without regret, the light recedes. The honey-colored light is now the color of the scent of apples. How slow the world, how slow the world, how slow one's grief for the hours that quickly slip away. Will you recall this room? I'm fond of it. What are those workmen's voices? Builders' men. The block still lacks one house, they sing. But today, I, I hear no sound. They shout and laugh, and now they're silent. It seems strange. How slow the red leaves of the voices. How uncertainly they come to cover us. As if in sleep, the leaves of my kisses cover by degrees your body's secret hiding places. And while you forget the tall midsummer leaves, the expanse of days we didn't kiss, deep down the body recollects. Your skin retains one half of sun, one half of moon. At ease, she's asleep. At this hour, men are already awake, though as yet only a little light strikes into them. A little suffices, the awareness merely of two things. The earth revolves and women sleep. Ascenting, we travel on to the end of the world. We need do nothing to assist it. People are many. People are many and many are their tongues. And many names have run into a single love. The old fragile silver becomes an afternoon suspended in the glow above the fields. In snares of a thousand gentle ears, the earth has caught the birds of the air's song. Yes. Understand and make yours from the olive groves the high, simple truth of the wind's trapped voice. People are many, and many are their tongues, and many names are needed for a single love. Trial him in the temple. Oh, how tired I am of my craven old brutish land, and how I'd like to get away from it to the north, where they say people are clean and noble, learned, rich, free, wide awake, and happy. Then, in the congregation, the brothers would say, disapprovingly, like a bird who leaves the nest is that man who forsakes his place. Well, I, now far away, would laugh at the law and ancient wisdom of this, my arid village. But I must never follow my dream, and I'll stay here till I die. For I'm craven and brutish, too. And what's more, I love with a desperate grief. This my poor, dirty, sad, unlucky homeland. Beginning of Canticle in the Temple. Now say, the broom tea blooms. Everywhere in the, the fields are red with poppies. With new sighs will thresh the ripened wheat and weeds. Ah, uh, young lips parting after dark. If only you knew how dawn delayed us, how long we had to wait, wait for light to rise in the gloom. But we have lived to save your words, to return you the name of everything, so that you'd stay on the straight path that leads to the mastery of the earth. We looked beyond the desert, plumbed the depth of our dreams, turned dry cisterns into peaks, scaled by the long steps of time. Now say, we hear the cries of the wind on the high sea of crested grain. Now say, we shall be ever faithful to the people of this land. Faithful heart. 
to a grief that goes beyond sense. Only the impossible turns a gentle face. The pure palace became a heap of stones, the walls, air, the panels, ash. Marauder in that place of dispossession, groping, stumbling, slowly straightening up, discouragement roams the night, plundering excitement and memory. I know from where the inexhaustible fire will come to animate the lifeless dust. I see the final monument in ruins and I shall climb with no resting stages up to the high road of runaway dawn by what's left of the stair that leads nowhere. If I'm let. I'll go on living if I'm let as one surviving a distant song. I'll go on living with brows frowning against anger and mud. I'll live straight back as a judge, merely looking, not speaking, like a wall in its pattern, like a stone in its rut. Happy the man. Happy the man who has lived under an alien sky and whose peace has not been disturbed. And happy who is searching into the rugged gorge of eyes in love finds no falsehood lying there. And he who appreciates his days, the one as much as the other, like the equal parts of a measured treasure and does not pursue the runaway memory of another. Happy the man who does not look back where the past, ever insatiable, takes away from us even hope chaste pawn of the truce which death has granted. Happy he who does not urge his desire onward, who drops the oars and stretching himself in the frail boat, turns towards the clouds, silent, surrendering himself to untroubled waters. Painterly art, presence, first of all. And that's why the canvas prefers animal skins, tents in the desert, ship sails, women's clothes. You catch the images and fuck them. Make things and not more images. Things that will never go on the internet. Let your pictures be an amphibious bat that eats mangoes and squids, that in the morning bites white breasts and at night hallucinates with Verlaine and the rest this included nonsense. Stop fussing about walls and ceilings. Remember that architects are nothing but bad bricklayers and that we are nourished only by ourselves. So open your nostrils to Velazquez and fill your eyes with Virgil in the markets of Africa, in the brothels of Asia. Your pigments are the ashes of your life. See to it then that they retain a shadow of the fire that burns you. Don't waste a fragment of an instant on reviews or specialized magazines. Feed, if necessary, your vanity on fish bones and orange peel, like we feed the chickens, or better still, mouse in the cellar of your palace. Leave it to take care of itself. Let it gnaw old newspapers. Ideas. Ideas do not produce pictures, vice versa. And besides, those ideas serve not to make new pictures, but not to make them. Otherwise, it would be like a bouillabaisse with crabs and fish writhing in the soup. So painting fabricates and destroys ideas and images, metaphors, theories, sensations, emotions. What's left? That's the question. And yet it's simple. As simple as love and hunger. Thank you very much.
those are, uh, are some pretty astonishing poems. Elegy from Val V. Drera, number eight. Another winter and each time yet more arid. At the end of the avenue, the apple orchard has gone back to being a patch of lilac-covered silence that is increased by a single bark. Now, beyond the plain, and it quickly fades. Goodbye. Goodbye. Intoxicated by a sense of wood smoke in the forest and of resin, I kindled the stove of memories that draws well. I become confused. I see through chinks and crevices in the wall the birth of ancient dawns that never, ever managed to make full day all the rubbish of years near and far chunks of marble bonfires, old dead trees, and on many abandoned tracks, trains that have stopped. I am an attic full of lumber, and yet not a single sound will anyone catch a whisper of when time's engine demolishes it. For one day, someone entered suddenly, transforming everything, and with so much light that I became blinded, but seeing in something there something certain, utterly certain, a fixed star staring at me steadily in the dark. On this side of that excess, everything changed for me forever to better things and unexpected, where rocks to diamonds, where thimbles to bells, peeling out for feast day, where sewing needles, lightning conductors, where fairground horses, constellations. And so, it's a lie, all that moaning I utter, all the groaning I make, all the whining for that, which however endures, the poets lay the foundations. And thus it is that the arid winter with which the poem opened has become in the making of it fertile June, happy and positive and limitless, and all the wheat turns into the bread of light. With music, you might hear it better. With you, I'll always be truthful. And if I speak time and again of, of my day-by-day -day solitary death, and with a cruel accent stress this single syllable of my modicum of wisdom. It's merely because I find it pleasing for you to sense deep down when you've reached the chilly path of your final resting place, how very quietly and humbly I love you. Do you see? The soft wind in the grass, and you and I, a woman and a man, amid all the names that limb such fragile beauty. And this afternoon, which for us might prove immortal, but you'd never guess from my eyes who and how I am. And now you fill me up with words of clay, empty, dense, jarring, until an insurmountable wall is built this curt stepping away that already severs me from you entirely. Thank you. Thank you. Hello from California. Laurie Anderson. And Louis.